All right, guys, welcome back to Wide Awake News Radio. My name is Charlie McGrath. I'm, the, uh, I'm your host tonight. I forgot where, where I was there for a second. Uh, it is the 14th day of May. Uh, dang, this month's almost gone. Uh, tonight is uh, Tuesday, and joining us here in just a minute is the Ellen Brown, author of Web Debt, webdebt.com. Uh, and uh, always a pleasure to have her on here. And you know, we, we're gonna we're gonna just kind of look at some uh, some economic uh, events going on. Uh, especially, I want to look at the, you know the IRS and uh, and and their new targeting or not new, their uh, now revealed targeting of uh, of what's going on uh, as far as going after anybody who uh, decides that they uh, they want to put the word patriot uh, or Tea Party or freedom or you name it. Uh, and it's not this isn't anything new. It is uh, catching the attention of uh, of uh, mainstream establishment media uh, as of late, but uh, we'll certainly point out tonight that uh, this isn't anything new. This is an ongoing uh, event. All right, here's here's the the situation. Um, we have Brett, our producer for the Rinse Radio Network. Uh, he's uh, we we want everybody to to uh, congratulate him because uh, he is going to be uh, engaging in the time honored. Uh, uh, tradition and institution of marriage he's getting married so uh tonight will be the last uh i, I think i have this right now i'm looking at the schedule i'm not 100 percent sure gary uh, uh if tonight's the last program no excuse me tomorrow night will be the last live program of the week thursday and friday are going to be rebroadcast so our producer brett uh can go off and get married because uh that's what he wants to do and we wish him the best of luck brett congratulations i haven't uh I haven't said it to you yet on air, uh, or or even in text or or in a phone call. But congratulations! Uh, I wish you and your soon-to-be missus absolute bliss, and uh, you're a great guy. And uh, I'm sure that uh, she's very lucky to get you because uh, I've dealt with uh, Brett now for uh, almost uh, three years, and uh, he has been a fixture of this program as much as anybody else. And uh, and nightly, uh, over at least over the last week, and, and I'm going to want to continue to do so. I've been uh, thanking Gary Hendershaw for production uh, Monday through Wednesday and his uh, contribution to the program. Of course, Karen Quinn Tostado, who uh, is uh, handling all the scheduling and her own uh, segment every Friday, and uh, Eric Lovely. And uh, I should be, I'm, I'm mistaken for not uh, mentioning uh, Jeff Rince, of course, for putting us on the air, and uh, uh, Brett Waite for uh, producing this program every night. All right, let's get on with this. Let's do this. We have an hour, we have Ellen Brown, and we're going to talk. Uh, some issues that are, are touching the mainstream. Ellen, thank you very much uh, for joining me again. It's, it's great always to have you on. Great always to be on. Thanks, Shirley. You, you've been looking at this uh, in the establishment media here, the, the IRS and the targeting of people like, oh, I don't know, you, because uh, you, you dare to, to speak out, or, or maybe me, because I consider myself uh, a freedom lover or a patriot or a tea party or whatever. Have you, have you seen, you've been following this? No. <laughs> I am right. drowning in endnotes at the moment. I'm trying to get a, a book finished and off to the formatters that I'm late on. <clears throat> okay. Well, I, I know so that... The la- yeah, I'm, I'm interested. All right. Well, in, in a nutshell, you know, it's been revealed that, uh, and it's ironic because uh, not only has it been revealed, but the, the one of the main culprits, her name is uh, Lois Lerner. Sounds like a cartoon name. Lois Lerner, director uh, for the IRS Exemption uh, organiz- uh, Exempt Organization Division. Is she's about to receive the presidential medal? Well, it, it's been revealed that uh, the, the the IRS since 2000 and uh, you know earlier than this, but the, the report is 2011, uh, has been purposely targeting targeting anybody with these key words in their name: patriot or Tea Party or you know freedom or uh, the, these groups that uh, uh, are becoming more popular because of a more oppressive, uh, corrupt government. You know they are now being turned on. Uh, openly by uh, by this same government. So, uh, you know, it certainly uh, lends to what you and I talk about every time you're on here, which is a, a domination of, uh, of our political uh, our political system and our financial system by a, a group of folks who want to do everything possible to maintain that power. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen Brown did it. So, I'll say one that I, that I just was very excited about was uh, Elizabeth Warren's bill to um, 
to give the students the same deal that the big banks get, which is 0.75%. No reason they couldn't from the Fed. It's, it's free. But it turns, I mean, free to the Fed. If the Fed could come up with $23 trillion for the banks, they should be able to come up with $1 trillion in money created on their books. Do you think this will happen? Do you think this will well, happen? The problem is it won't cost the taxpayers a cent. It won't cost Congress a cent. But it turns out Congress, or sorry, that, you know, it's the now the Education Department that's issuing these loans. They're making, I think it was 34 cents on the dollar on these loans. Like, it's a huge moneymaker for our government. That's, that's totally usurious, for one thing. I mean, I'm sure that's not the interest rate, but that's with the fees and, all, you know, the sure. defaults and all the things they can squeeze them for. So, it, so is, the, it is the corrupt... They'll be losing a big cash cow. That's the problem. It's not that it's going to cost anything. It's that they're not going to have this big money maker that they had, which is terrible. They're making money off our poor students who are our future. And well, I have my own uh, typist. Is she's thirty? You know, wait, are you have a typist? I have a typist. Well, oh I'm. <laughs> I'm writing a book and I'm almost done and you know I need help with it. So anyway, <laughs> she's so she's 31 years old. She's $180,000 in debt. And what she wants to be is a school teacher. And she can't be a school teacher until she gets her teaching certificate and then she has to put in a year for free to you know it's like an internship. It's She has 180,000 in she has 180,000 in school debt? Yeah. Or, or you got to be kidding well, me. No, I suppose, well, she's got two master's degrees, and that's one problem. She's overqualified, and therefore they won't hire her. But she, she'd settle for being a grade school teacher now. But there's yeah, no way to pay it off. There's no way to get, I mean, the reason they do this is on the representation that when they get out of school, they can get a good job and pay off the loan. And now there are no jobs. Now, whose fault is that? That's the fault of the banks. So you would think that it's the bank's duty to give them interest-free loans to get out of this mess that the banks got them into. Who would think that that we the people would have a vested interest in educating the next uh, generation? Th this typist you have, God bless her heart, right? 180 grand in debt and, and two master's degrees. And uh, two gonna... kids. That's your other problem. <laughs> it gets better and better. This is like, <laughs> it's like Springer. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know... She has you know, a boyfriend, but he he's afraid to marry her because he's going to be marrying one hundred eighty thousand dollars in debt. No, she should just I, step I saw up. It, I saw step up and file bankruptcy right now because I mean I, no, I don't. You can't, you can't get out of it. Uh, you student, can't get right. out of it in bankruptcy. She went to a lawyer that she couldn't afford, who told her, "I'm not going to touch it because you're a student." And and you're just not going anywhere. Yeah. Well, let, but the how about the control apparatus angle of this? So I mean, if we look at. You know, uh, what are we? Tr we're trained dollars in, in debt right now. And, and you, then you have a government that has, you know, millions of these kids that are, uh, you know, the, they, they're they a valuable asset. Even if they're loaded with debt, they're a valuable asset. They're educated up or, or at least, you know, quasi educated up. They have uh, earning potential, they have working potential. Well, you, now you have a, another control apparatus, just like a welfare state or, you know, uh, any of these other uh, so social safety nets, what I'm, which I'm not opposed to. But I am opposed to them being used as a stick, you know, as a weapon uh, that can be unleashed at any time for, for you know, control, period. I mean, if you, if you tell these students, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to give you a, a, a pass on this, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll go ahead and push granny out the door and uh, support any kind of uh, legislation that uh, further erodes the freedom of this country. Why wouldn't they? I mean, they have a vested interest in it. I, I don't understand. You mean if they support the... The Warren bill? No, no. What I'm saying is the student debt in and of itself, and if I run out of time on this, I'll, I'll try to break it down in the back seat. Student debt, this, this trillion dollars that the American taxpayer inevitably right, ends, ends up on the hook for because it's, it's guaranteed and backed by the American taxpayer. But every major uh, segment, it seems, of the economy, every major segment that, that uh, is showing prosperity to a very select few is, ends up costing the people of this country one way or another. The ultimate uh, way I believe that it costs is it creates a system, uh, and I hate to use the word nanny state, it, it's more of an authoritarian state because they have this control uh, uh, mechanism set up. In this instance, it's student loans. You have a giant block of uh, uh, people out there that are behest and beholden to the government to either, you know, you can't even you can't even file bankruptcy and get out of it. 
you're beholding on them, uh, beholden on them uh, to let you off the hook or tell you what you have to do uh, in order to get out. But we're going to be back with Ellen Brown, more Wide Awake News Radio. Hang tight. Guys, welcome back to Wide Awake News Radio. I'm Charlie McGrath, 14th day of May. Uh, Ellen Brown is our guest, and we continue the conversation a little bit about debt. Uh, and, and, and I want to, right now, if, uh, if Ellen's uh, employee is, is listening or ever listens to this rebroadcast, that, that we're, I'm, I'm hopefully not offensive because she's certainly not alone. I mean, there's uh, the average student, the last time I looked at the statistic, uh, is graduating with uh, close to $40,000 uh, in debt that they get to carry with them. And in a lot of cases, it's the most heinous kind of uh, uh, interest rates and, and amounts they end up paying uh, are absolutely ridiculous. And it's not necessary. Gary was told us the story during the break, you know, that, and, and, you know, we've heard people like Ron Paul, Ellen, in the, in the past talk about, and he's right. It used to be, it was something where if you were going to college, you had a job at a, at a, at a pizza joint or a beer joint and you paid your way through college. Well, the, you know, just like everything else, just like a housing market that, that is exploding at 20% a year uh, during the uh, last decade, uh, it's erroneous. It's fake. It's fall. It, you know, you're, you're doing this by uh, accounting tricks that allow a whole bunch of wealth to go to few, and more and more and more debt be put on to others, and prices blow up out of control. Certainly not keeping with potential earning potential, right? How is this hundred and eighty thousand dollar debt as a teacher? I don't care as what. Uh, fill in the blank. Well, you know, I don't. You know, what does a doctor make out of the shoot? You know, that that's that is an incredible burden. Uh, that this that, uh, that these kids are carrying, even if even a fifty thousand dollar debt, you, you entry level job, what do you thirty grand a year max? I mean, it, it's it's a system that is obviously designed to make someone wealthy, but it, 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 it inevitably enslaves uh, this, the the populace as a whole. Am I do you agree with my take here? I totally agree. I I went to Berkeley for free. Tuition was free. And it, that was in the 1960s. I shouldn't say that, but that's how old I am. And I, uh, I didn't even think and, you were born then. <laughs> when, I, when I went to law school, it was uh, $600 a year. UCLA Law School, it's now $35,000 a year for tuition, and that's for in state, $45,000 for out of state. It's huge. So, what happened between the 60s and now? Well, one thing was prop. 13 in California, but it, it, if we could come up with the money then, we could come up with it now. It was in the I 1960s, have, they had this whole sort of New Deal attitude where we can afford it, you, that put out the credit and it'll come back to you, and it did. Well, but, but I mean, that isn't it though, right? I mean, that, that isn't, you know, we see, we see the government sector involved in private sector, and, and inevitably, when that happens, it's a crony capitalist system and the costs go up, profits go up for few, burden expands for most. Yeah. That, that, I mean, you know, and, and again, it doesn't matter if you're looking at housing or if you're looking at the military industrial complex or you're looking at uh, uh, the education system. If as soon as it becomes crony capitalistic, then it is destined to look really good on paper for, for a, a period of time, but inevitably fail. And when it fails, the debt is always uh, placed onto the people. Because you know they they, uh, they supported it for decades in a lot of cases, and uh, you know you have crisis after crisis. This is where we're at right now. This is why you know the work you do is so important because it uh, everything that we talk about. You talk and we have a minute or so before this break, but um, we're going to talk about your conference uh, and everything you talk about in your writing and your website. It it, it is not only important, I, 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 Ellen. I believe it's it's uh, inevitable, important and inevitable because. Uh, this this isn't going to last. I mean, this just isn't. We talked about China during the break, and maybe we'll get into that a little bit. But the the model of expansion for the name of expansion, and, and creation of debt for the for the creation of a profit for a few, it's a failure. It's been proven to be a failure, and this is going to fail as well. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> so we need we need you out there. We need these alternatives. We need uh, uh, you know. I think yeah, we just have a, a wrong. Um, idea of of what money is and money and credit. I mean, it's only it's only a receipt for work performed and a debt owed. So if you've got the workers, if you've got the materials, there's no reason you can't get them together and build something. And all you do is you pay with 
uh, receipts, like community receipts, which are backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. That's what the original colonial paper script was. Right. That right. it got a bad name because some of them, some of the colonies, just kept printing and printing, and they didn't bring it back. But if you if you recognize that it's that it's basically a receipt against future taxes, or when you give something to the government, you get a receipt from them, and then they'll accept that receipt in your payment of taxes. In other words, you've already got a debt to the government because that that's the collective services that everybody enjoys. So the fact that your debt might not be due, the bill might not be due for six months, and you you pay now, then you get the little receipt showing that you paid, and then you can use that receipt in the payment of taxes, and that makes the whole thing a feedback loop so it's sustainable. In other words, they put money out and they take money back. And, and you've proven on this program time and time again that it, it isn't a pipe dream by a lawyer slash author individual who employs a typist and has a pilot. It's worked throughout history before. <laughs> we're gonna be back with <laughs> we're gonna be back with Ellen Brown and more Wide Awake News Radio. Hang tight. <laughs> we'll get back to Wide Awake News Radio. Ellen Brown is laying it down during the break. Uh, we're we're gonna continue this conversation. Uh, a little bit, and and you know, I, I under, I, I was ch kidding about your title and all your your vast uh, resources in the break, but I, you know, I, I didn't mention at the top of the show. You are very, very accomplished. You're a lawyer. You're an author. Uh, you've done a lot of great work in you in in your uh, in your career, and uh, you know, we, I, I personally uh, appreciate you coming on here uh, on these visits impromptu in some cases uh, to share your wisdom and knowledge with us. So. Uh, let me let me put that out there. Okay. Quantitative easing. I want to get into this a little bit. You mentioned that uh, we talked about bringing that up during the break. Eighty-four billion dollars a month. The Federal Reserve is buying it. I told Ellen during the break today. I had uh, I had lunch with a friend of mine who happens to be a vice president of a, of a regional, and uh, I get the impression, and and it because it's reality, that that uh, we're trying to fill up the punch bowl again. And uh, honestly, folks, I, I've been saying it quite a bit lately. I think you have a, a little window of time, and it could be a couple of years. It could be a half a, half a decade, but they're 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 going they're pulling out all the stops to recreate the exact same scenario we had uh, that brought us a uh, 2008, uh, which ushered in all legislation and all control and all government planning. Uh, you know, everything needed to that have uh, happened did through that crisis, but they're doing it again and. Uh, uh, this is your opportunity uh, to get yourself in a position uh, to see an ever to see a very dramatically different world uh, in in the coming years. Ellen Brown, tell me this uh, uh, quantitative easing, the eighty four billion a month of Fed buying this debt, and and this is boosting our economy. This is going right back into the economy, right? It's not going into the economy at all. It goes onto the reserve into the reserve accounts of banks. So it's just an asset swap before they had something, either mortgage-backed security or uh, government securities. So the Federal Reserve creates money on its books by double interest booking, keeping the same way the banks do. So they have an overdraft on their own account. They buy the goods, whatever it is, mortgage-backed securities, or I guess half of it's for mortgage-backed securities and half is for federal securities. Mm -hmm. And so now the bank has dollars on their in their reserve account. So technically they're cash balance has gone up, but they have the same, you know, their assets and liabilities look the same as before, and now the Fed just has an overdraft and then they have some sort of an asset. So things have shifted around, but no new money's entered the economy. The only way it would enter the economy is if the banks are doing more lending. And I just saw a chart yesterday of actual lending since 2008, it actually had dropped for a bit and now it's just back up to where it was in 2008. So we're definitely not in hyperinflation. We're, we're still actually in deflation. So we need to get money out there in order, we need to get money into the pockets of people so they can get out there and shop. I know you don't want everybody shopping, but certainly, I mean, you don't want to use up your resources, but still, that's, that is what stimulates, you, you need demand. That's what stimulates demand. So that's why I think this idea of uh, Elizabeth Warren with the the student loans is brilliant. They well, should I, I, why wouldn't it have been brilliant in two thousand and eight to take nine trillion dollars in mortgage debt? A, a large percentage of that was held uh, uh, in, in quasi government. You know, 
nine trillion dollars that that was our national mortgage debt load in 2008 now we've spent arguably conservatively more, double that arguably 10 times that uh in order to rescue institutions that uh that uh, uh are, are not arguably literally fraudulently uh fail uh yeah. fraudulently, well i uh, think that the fed coughed up 23 trillion right. but those were just loans so you can't really say we have spent it, the taxpayers spent 700 billion and then some more after that um but but the federal reserve has come up with that money and it didn't it certainly didn't hyperinflate the money supply so what if they came up with 9 trillion for the homeowners and 1 trillion for the uh students we're only talking loans they're they're going to get paid back but they're going to be in virtually interest free loans that's the difference so um, instead of paying double or triple by the time your 30 year mortgage is up you'll you'll just have paid a little more than than the actual principal so people in, in a public in, in a public bank uh, in a scenario you know let's say you're your utopia right um would would, would you have I think about this sometimes. It, it seems that if if we claim to be, uh, you know, we we love humanity and and everybody has a right, uh, uh, you know, to prosper and a right to you know try to excel, uh, and and as a civilized people, it seems that and this is going to make some people mad. It seems that, it from my perspective, that, you know, just by the fact that you're born into civilization and in a society, there is an anticipation. You know, if you bring a child into the world to make it a better place, you, it doesn't seem unreasonable to have an anticipation of certain basic necessity items you need to survive. Uh, and and I know that sounds a little bit uh, you know socialistic to some. I totally, totally agree. <laughs> well, and it's you actually need that to to keep the economy running. In other yeah. words, people need a certain. You need to get money into people's pockets. So you could give people a thousand dollars a month. That would come out to, I think it comes out to a, I worked this out once, I'm thinking it might come out to a trillion dollars a year, I've forgotten now. Anyway, it comes out to something quite reasonable, you know, that they could, that the government could put into the economy and that money would come back, well here's the way I'm calculating it, assume the the uh, velocity of money in good times, it's it's up to something like five. So money changes hands five times. If the average tax rate is 20%, 20% times five, the government will get all the money back in taxes and then it can spend it out again and again. But that's the thing, the government has to put it out there first. And then that's what stimulates the economy. You can't expect the people to spend it first because they don't have it. That's right, and, and uh, the, the, the stumbling block there always uh, is corruption, right? Corruption between uh, uh, the government and the people. So, uh, you know, even though it is a simple matter of, of just, you know, moving columns around, look how easy it was when the the uh, people that were being benefited were these corporate interests. You talked it was only $700 billion. I I'd probably argue that only because of the mass destruction of wealth uh, that occurred yeah, after that. You know. True, true. Um, but, yeah. uh, but how simple was it for at that point in time, to jockey a few numbers around, move a few numbers around in boxes. Next thing you know, Goldman Sachs is healthy, Wells Fargo is, you know, all these institutions are still running, running amok and even more powerful. For that exact same thing, the exact same dollar amount, less actually, that could be done for you people, you, us, we, and and that would truly be instantaneous growth. I, I mean, it would be. Uh, it would be unbelievable. It'd be the complete and total uh, renaissance of probably the planet. Right. They supposedly they're helping out the banks because, well, starting with derivatives, the reason they allowed the banks to play with our deposits in the nineteen, well, when they uh, repealed the Glass Steagall Act, so that you could now use your deposits to gamble with. The reason they allowed the banks to do that was they were losing market share. So we so we had to help out the banks. Because they were losing their market share to commercial paper, you know, things like General Motors got the bright idea that they could actually finance their own cars instead of going to banks, and so banks weren't getting that business anymore. And um, the money market, people were putting their money there in the stock market, 
or the foreign competitors, they were getting the business. So just to help out the banks, Alan Greenspan said we needed to allow them to play with derivatives, meaning with our money, playing with their liquidity, which is our money, because as soon as you put your money in the bank, it becomes their money. That's a legal point that nobody really was aware of until recently. They never now they know. This. <laughs> now they know, and now they're going to know more. I mean, that, that, that's, uh, that's I researched point. that a little, why, why, that, why that is the legal result, and it was because in the 19th century, the, the, before they had deposit insurance, the depositors kept breathing down the necks of the banks and they were all nervous about, oh, you shouldn't make that loan or that loan because you're putting our money in jeopardy. And so they, so said, the it's theirs. Said they can't run a business that way. So we've got to just say it's their money and they'll pay you back when you. Oh, when you what a mistake that ended up being. Ellen Brown, we're going to be right back. I want to touch on uh, super, pri or, uh, super derivative priority when we come back, as well as the conference and your book. we got a lot to shove into the next, uh, next little segment. We're going to be back with Ellen Brown in just a minute. Hang tight. Final segment of Wide Awake News Radio, Charlie McGrath, Ellen Brown, as we continue this conversation, a couple things to, to go over. We're talking about quantitative easing, having zero benefit to anybody uh, except uh, bankers. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about derivatives. You know, the, the, the news is do excuse me, dominated right now uh, by tyranny, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the IRS tyranny. Uh, and uh, but there's this looming monster that's still out there. And again, uh, my warning is you got a couple of years. You got to, you know, it, everything stayed evil, even even uh, on the same playing field. They, they try to keep uh, pushing this game down the road. I think it's a couple of years and get yourself in a position uh, to take care of yourself after that, because it's going to be Katie bar the door. But tell me a little bit about how a uh, priority derivatives could change everything tomorrow morning. Uh, one bank. So, um, so the claimants, the derivatives claimants have super priority in bankruptcy. And again, this was done to help the banks. When, the, when it was a fledgling industry, the derivatives industry, of course, now it's up to 1.2 quadrillion. But originally it was considered something that needed to be nurtured. So they allowed the derivatives claimants to be first in line in the event of a bankruptcy. So we've never had that before. Historically, your FDIC insurance was always good to, de to protect your deposits. But now they've allowed the commingling of deposits and derivatives. And J.P. Morgan and Bank of America, the two big derivatives banks, both have uh, over $1 trillion in deposits. And they have $75 trillion and $79 trillion respectively, in derivatives. So that that's insane. That's all commingled. And so if they go bankrupt, the derivatives claims are going to go rush in there, take all the money. Any kind of collateral is going to be gone by the time that either the FDIC gets in there. They've got $25 billion in their fund to cover $9 trillion, But then they say, well, we're backed by the government. But Dodd-Frank now says that the government, meaning the taxpayers, are not going to bail out the banks anymore if they have a big derivatives. You know, they're not oh. going to bail out for gambling. And... And, of course, that's the type of bust that it would be. So, It sounds so, familiar, doesn't it? it, it I mean, it, the, the scenario sounds familiar. The outcome is going to be something completely new. And, and yeah, what you're and talking now, about. Now we have the bail-in thing, which that's is. What I was just going to say. I was just going to yeah, say that. Because there's no, now that the governments have said, mm -mm, we're not doing that again, no more $700 billion, now there's, now that the, the formal um, uh, dictated from on a high uh, blueprint is that they're supposed to take their creditors' money, turn their creditors' money into equity or stock, bank stock, right. so that they'll recapitalize themselves with bank with uh, with creditors' money. Well, who are the creditors? It turns out it's us, the depositors, and that would include even the state and local governments who think that they're uh, secured because they require security for any big bank that takes their their revenues, but that security is going to be gone because the the derivatives claims come first. That's right. And and Mike uh, Mike uh, Mike SLC is in the chat room right now. He just posted something in there, and I don't know if it's on listening to us on this topic, but uh, conspiracy is, is uh, nonsense. Reality uh, is stranger than fiction. Difficult to tell the difference. And I I I, I read that or that te that chat right when. What is that? Is that a text? Is that a chat? I read that comment, 
uh, right when you were talking about the bail-in. And, um, you know, that, you don't, we don't need a conspiracy to... to yeah, uh, we can see it. It's right in front of our eyes. <laughs> that's right. And, and so the scenario is simple. And then I want to jump onto this conference because we're, we're, we're going to run out of time. The scenario is real simple. Couldn't be any more simple. You, you have a crisis, you change laws, and you, uh, you do what you need to do to save banks. That's what happened in 2008. Everything written for then has been uh, patted on the back as a heroic uh, uh, endeavor to prevent this from happening again. By God, we'll never have another bailout in this country. You know what that means? It's a bail-in. That means you exactly. lose. <laughs> that's reality. That's, that's not a conspiracy. That's what's next. Uh, you know, so years. the whole system is wrong. That's it. There's no way that this system can be salvaged. And that's why we have to set up a different system, which to me, it's just crystal clear that if, if we own the banks, like, well, we have one model, the Bank of North Dakota, there would not be derivatives gambling because we would set the rules and we would say we're not going to gamble in derivatives. There'd be no um, bonuses, fees, commission, uh, multi-million dollar CEOs. Um, so, and it would be very safe because it'd be a hundred percent guaranteed by the government. They're the ultimate guarantor anyway. Right. So, and it and, and there's and there's a little and place. The profits go back to us. I agree. Profits it's go back started. to us. Yes. Yeah. The, the inevitably responsible we the people. The profits go back to us. Why? Why on earth should it? We've been trained to believe that we don't deserve. Uh, we don't deserve that. That it has to be. You know these uh, these uh, juggernauts of finance that that uh, that uh, wield these webs of debt. I use that perfectly for Ellen Brown. Um, <laughs> but there is a conference coming up that that talks about just that. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, our Public Banking Institute conference is June second to fourth in um, San Rafael, California. That's the Bay Area, and it's. Um, on Sunday night, which is June second, we have a, a sort of a special event that you could just attend that if you wanted. But the keynote speaker is Matt Taibbi and um, um, Brigitte Dans okay, Dans yeah. Dans here. <laughs> She's nice, uh, nice. from Iceland, and she helped. So she she was instrumental in this whole populist movement to not bail out the banks, which worked very well for Iceland. It, uh, contrary to what everybody was predicting. So she knows about populist movements and what you can do if you can get the people together, which is what I think we need. It has to be a ground up movement because, well, there is hope with somebody like uh, Elizabeth Warren, which I think is wonderful that she's bringing that up. But, but in general, it's pretty hard to get Congress to do anything. But if you get a fire under them from the bottom or if you, we could do an initiative and we wouldn't even need Congress, but first, the people have to be sort of on the pa same page, which means everybody has to understand what we're talking about here. If you want a grass movement, you've got to get the grass all, all waving in the same direction. So that's what we'd be talking about is why the current system is totally hopeless and dangerous and why we have to act and quite quickly and what, how, what we could do, what's been done historically, what's been done globally, the, the models, other models. So I think what we need to do is set up our own banking system. It doesn't mean that all the banks would have to be public, but if you had, I would envision a system where you have 50 Bank of North Dakotas. In other words, every state has its own little mini-fed. So the little mini-fed can partner with the local banks. Now they're not going to get into derivatives because they're not going to they're not going to put up the money for derivatives. And they're so it, it it works very well in North Dakota. The Bank of North Dakota is there for for example, when they it's had a, a utility, big flood. sorry, it's a utility. I mean, it's a utility. This yeah. is common infrastructure that we need. This is it, it isn't it a the government. It serves the local governments. It partners with the local banks. It it builds infrastructure for the country. You know, like helps build hotels and roads and all those things that they need. And if there's an emergency, they're right there. They do moratoriums on mortgages and. They're there with the funding to rebuild. So when they did have a huge fund, they, a flood, they re rebuilt very quickly. So they're on the job. They're not saying, oh, sorry, there's a provision in your policy that says this type of flood isn't covered or something like that. They're, right. they're there to help, and they do help. It, it, it's common sense. You know, again, it, it's a reality conspiracy. You know, go with reality because you're going to be 
you're going to be more entertained if you understand the reality that we're in. The, the, you know, uh, there, there's people that hear the, bu- the, the public banking thing and they immediately think that it's something different. But, it, you know, we, we got to shed that, uh, that uh, the mysticism of, uh, of our current system because, it, I mean, it isn't uh, healthy for a nation. It isn't healthy for the planet. And it certainly doesn't benefit uh, these uh, 7 billion things running around we call human beings. It benefits very few. I, I'm excited for the conference, and uh, if you know, we, we talked during the break. If is there any way on earth I can make it out there? It's in what three weeks. Uh, I would love to go out there and uh, and listen and record and, and you know and and be maybe maybe up right before Matt to be. I don't know. Maybe a little little speech, a little pep talk. No, All we right. can, we have special provisions for people like you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Well, let me tell. You, let's. Uh, we got uh, two minutes left. Uh, everybody, the last time Ella was on the program, you remember that she was uh, working feverishly to finish her book. Ellen, you got two minutes. Do we have a title yet? It was secret, top secret last time. Uh, well, my current title is uh, Escape from the Web of Debt, The Public Bank Solution. So the real like title it. is The Public Bank Solution. Yeah. All right. And it's going to it's gonna cover, obviously. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, globally, historically, it's covering more than I intended for it to cover. But who knew? There were so many interesting things out there. You know, you just start researching it and every country has an interesting story or every going back 5,000 years, there are very interesting th- stories. And nobody ever told us these things. They're all things that... Um, it's like new to me. So and my way of writing, because I never know if I'll ever sell a book, is I just write what's interesting to me. If I find something interesting. So I just, I know my kids were taught to, in school, that you had to have a to- topic sentence and a concluding sentence. And, you know, it had to be so structured. You had to know where you're going ahead of time. And it was, it blocked them. They couldn't really write. The way I write is I look for what's really interesting and then I throw that up there and then there's something else that's really interesting and I throw that up there. So I wind up with a, this sort of web of interesting things and then, then you go back and you weave them all together and you, you make them into a quilt that, that looks like something. So it's like sculpture. Every time you go over it, you know, the form within appears from all this. Yeah. Yeah. From, from the matrix that you've spun yeah. through your interesting topics. Uh, yeah. and, and I was smiling, if you saw me on camera there, I was smiling when you were saying that because you, you, you uh, write about what's interesting to you. And I was going to say, you know, this, this program, this last hour has been a microcosm of your book because, you know, we just, we just went with what was interesting to us. And, and to me, that's the, you know, the most, uh, uh, the most gratifying interviews and the most uh, uh, informative uh, information comes in that kind of format because you're not trying to you know, bring down, uh, you know, A, B, C, D, especially in the world of banking as you or in the world of debt. Uh, it should be boring. Yes. Y- mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. But it's going to get unboring. Uh, I, I mean, for me, it's already it's be more exciting than we want it to be. Yeah. I, I do believe you're right. Ellen Brown, uh, give us that title again. Uh, Breaking the Web of Debt, the Public Banking Solution. Did I get that right? <laughs> Escaping the Web of Debt. Escaping. Debt, public I, bank sorry. But, so right. the Public Bank Solution. Yeah. All right. Well, here's the deal. When when uh, when it's ready to, to come out, I definitely uh, I definitely want to get on here and talk about it and uh, uh, and try to promote that book and get it out there. Uh, Ellen Brown, thank you very much. Always a pleasure to have you on. Oh, it's great. Thanks, Charlie. You're very you're very much welcome. Guys, stay tuned for Jeff Rince because he is coming up next. We will see you tomorrow night again. Tomorrow night will be the last live program of the week, so our good friend Brett can go uh, and engage in. Uh, Uh, the institution of marriage and we wish him the best of luck and, and we congratulate him. All right, guys, Jeff's next. Have a good night. Peace.